My name is San Jacob Ta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York, and today's video is on the subject of pericarditis. Someone actually wrote to me and said, look, you know, I've been diagnosed with pericarditis, I'm very worried about it, could you do a video on it? And as you know, I'm currently quarantining, and uh, therefore I have uh, a bit of time, so I thought let's go for it. So here is a video on pericarditis. Okay, so pericarditis refers to inflammation of the pericardium. What is the pericardium? The pericardium is a sac within which the heart sits. So the heart is enclosed by, it sits within a sac called the pericardium. And this sac has two layers. One is called the visceral layer, the other is called the parietal layer. And these layers are separated by a potential space which contains a little bit of fluid, 10 to 50 mils of fluid. When you have acute inflammation of this sac, that is called acute pericarditis. If the inflammation spreads from the, from the sac to the surface of the heart itself, it is termed myopericarditis. About 5% of all patients who present to accident and emergency with chest pain, which is not deemed to be a heart attack or angina, are ultimately diagnosed with pericarditis. So it's fairly common. The question is, why does this inflammation happen? And there are a multitude of causes, but by far and away, the most common causes, certainly in the Western world, is a presumed viral infection. The cause, the commonest cause depends on geography, which part of the world you're in. So in developed countries, the commonest cause of acute pericarditis is a presumed viral infection. Common viruses that can cause this are parvovirus B19, Epstein-Barr virus, which causes glandular fever as well, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus, etc. In developing countries, the commonest causes of pericarditis are TB and HIV. There are lots of other causes of pericarditis as well, including bacterial infections, kidney failure, rheumatological conditions or autoimmune conditions such as SLE, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoid. Uh, pericarditis can even be caused by cancer, mesothelioma spread from other tumors like lung cancer or breast cancer. Also, if you've had recent cardiac surgery, so if you've had a bypass operation where people have manipulated the sac, then the sac can get inflamed and that can present with um, acute pericarditis. And even a recent heart attack, so some people after a heart attack, a few days after a heart attack, will develop pericarditis. Now, how does it present? Well, it may present out of the blue, so you're completely fine, and then one day you wake up and you've got the symptoms of pericarditis, which I'll talk about, but often it may also present after a flu-like respiratory or gastric illness. Now, pericarditis is often characterized by very severe chest pain, but it's usually reasonably easy to distinguish from anginal pain because in pericarditis, the pain is very sharp and it actually catches the breath when a person tries to breathe in. It's made worse when the patient coughs. It is characteristically, one of the characteristics of this condition is that the pain gets better when someone sits up and leans forward. So you would be in terrible pain when you're lying down, but if you sat forward, leant forward, you would feel better. And this is because this position reduces the pressure on the pericardium. Pain is a feature in over 95% of patients. Um, it is very prevalent in patients with an infection like a viral infection, but if you have pericarditis because you have kidney failure or possibly some rheumatological conditions, then the pain may not be as prevalent or as severe. One of the interesting things about this pain is it may radiate to the, to the trapezius ridge, and that's uh, very suggestive again. Um, and one of the things that is very helpful when you're making the diagnosis of pericarditis is for the doctor to listen to the heart. And the reason they listen to the heart is they're listening for something called a pericardial friction rub. Remember, you have the two layers of the pericardium, and if both layers are inflamed, when the heart moves within the pericardium, these two layers rub against each other because of the inflammation, and that can produce this scratchy, squeaky noise that can be heard by a stethoscope and an experienced doctor. The absence of a rub does not exclude the possibility of pericarditis, but the presence makes it very likely that this is what you're dealing with. Uh, the best way to hear it, uh, you know, 
uh, sometimes doctors make the mistake where they just listen to it. Actually, what you have to do is get the patient to lean forwards and even hold their breath or even get on your hands and knees and the doctor can listen to you when you're in that position. Of course, that can be difficult if you're in a lot of pain, but that's one way to hear that noise. Uh, pericarditis can be associated with ECG changes, specifically something called ST elevation. ST elevation is very important because ST elevation is also something that you see on the ECG in a person who's having a heart attack. And therefore, you know, pericarditis can sometimes be mistaken for a heart attack and vice versa. Um, it's important to know how to distinguish between the ST elevation you see in pericarditis compared to the ST elevation you see in a heart attack. Sometimes it can be incredibly difficult, but the important thing is you have to make that distinction because if you have pericarditis and you get the treatment for a heart attack, then that could actually do you harm. And of course, if you think it's pericarditis and someone is having a heart attack, then you may be depriving them of that treatment, which could improve their prognosis from the heart attack. And so it's important to make that distinction. And the way you make the distinction between pericarditis and a heart attack is that the ST elevation you see in pericarditis tends to be concave. Um, it tends to be saddle shaped. Whereas the ST elevation, ST elevation is an ECG pattern, whereas the ST elevation you see in uh, a heart attack tends to be a little bit more convex. In addition, in pericarditis, because you're dealing with inflammation of all of this pericardium, which is around the heart, the ST elevation seems to be seen in all the leads, okay, or seems to be very widespread in the majority of the leads. With a heart attack, however, the problem is a blockage in a vessel which is supplying a certain area of the heart. And therefore, you would only expect to see the ST elevation in those, chain, in those leads that are, that are supplying that particular territory, yeah, that are looking at that territory which is being supplied by this blood vessel which is blocked. So having said that, you know, sometimes it can be incredibly difficult and you have to put everything into context. You have to see the patient. Is the patient describing sharp pain? which is better when they sit forward, or is the, are they describing a dull, heavy sensation like an elephant sitting on their chest? Um, if someone comes to me and they're describing a dull, heavy sensation and they look gray and it looks like someone, they feel like someone's sitting on their chest, then I would think that's a heart attack, no matter what the ECG shows. Whereas if, it was, if it's a young guy, otherwise completely fit and well, sharp pain, uh, otherwise okay, then I would think more pericarditis. But usually you need an experienced doctor to make that diagnosis. We see um, typical ECG changes in about 60% of patients with pericarditis. And actually, when we see ECG changes, it tells us that there's some irritation of the heart itself rather than just the sac. Uh, as I say, this is not an absolute finding. And sometimes um, these differences between a heart attack and pericarditis can even mislead experienced professionals. Um, now, what else can be helpful? Blood tests. Up to 80% of patients uh, with pericarditis will have elevated markers of inflammation, such as an elevated white cell count, uh, elevated CRP levels. 30% uh, of patients with pericarditis may even have an elevation of their troponin levels. Troponin is a marker of uh, heart muscle damage. And when the troponin is elevated, a lot of people immediately think, oh, this patient's having a heart attack. But it's not true. Sometimes the troponin can be elevated because of inflammation of the pericardium, which is also spreading to the myocardium. In that sense, you know, pericarditis has a much better prognosis than a heart attack. So it's important to make that distinction. Um, but when you see the troponin to be elevated, it does signify that there's some inflammation of the heart muscle itself. And in that sense, the diagnosis would then be termed myopericarditis. Who needs to stay in hospital uh, with pericarditis? Well, if you have fever above 38 degrees, if the symptoms have presented over a number of weeks rather than suddenly, if you've not responded to simple treatment like anti-inflammatory painkillers, uh, if you're immunocompromised, or if there's evidence of fluid in this cavity, that potential space I was talking about, i.e. a pericardial effusion, then it is perhaps a good idea to stay in hospital as these uh, features point to a more complicated course of disease. I'm going to talk about the pericardial effusion in a second. Uh, uh, and so those are the people who should probably stay in hospital. If the pain is mild, if you're otherwise okay, there are no other issues, then it's quite reasonable to be at home. Uh, 
What are the complications associated with pericarditis? Now, generally, the prognosis of pericarditis depends on the cause of the pericarditis. If it is a viral cause, which by far is the commonest cause in uh, the de developed world, then the prognosis is generally excellent and people tend to make a full recovery with settling of their inflammatory markers, with resolution of their pain, with recovery of their um, you know, physical functioning within four to six weeks. The main problem for most patients is really the pain that they experience. And often the pain can be very severe and they often need to be in hospital or have some symptomatic relief with strong painkillers. With strong painkillers, the pain usually responds well. If the pericarditis is due to a bacterial infection or due to cancer, then the pericarditis can be dangerous and is associated with a much higher mortality, almost 20 to 30 percent. There are a few things um, to be aware of which may complicate pericarditis. Um, firstly, if there is a lot of inflammation, then you can get a buildup of fluid in the space between the two layers of the pericardium, and this can therefore take up a lot of space and therefore because the heart sits in this sac and if the sac has got fluid which is building up between its two layers then in some ways it's going to restrict the heart from filling up filling up with blood and when that happens because the heart is not able to fill with much blood it's not able to pump much blood out and that can become a life-threatening emergency because of a lack of blood going around the body. So when you have fluid in, in, the in this space between the two layers of the pericardium, it's called a pericardial effusion, and you may have fluid which doesn't do anything, which is not actually having an effect on the hemodynamics of the heart, or you may have a buildup of a lot of fluid, you know, lot of fluid, and that can actually start compressing the heart and stopping it from relaxing or filling up with blood. And therefore, one of the most important investigations in anyone who comes in with pericarditis is to do a scan of the heart and just make sure they're not, they don't have an effusion. If the effusion is just sitting there and it's not bothering the patient, then you don't need to do anything about it. You just treat the pericarditis and the fluid will go away. On the other hand, if the fluid is beginning to compress the heart and there is evidence that there's a lack of blood going around the body, as evidenced by um, blood pressure falling, heart rate being very high, the patient getting very breathless, then in that setting, that becomes a medical emergency and you actually have to go in and take that fluid up. And you can do that just by sticking a needle into the pericardium under local anesthetic and then just tapping that fluid and draining the fluid out. But if you leave it, then there's a very high mortality, particularly if it's already beginning to cause compression. If it, as I say, if it is not causing compression, if the patient is completely well, then just treat the pericarditis and the fluid will uh, settle over a period of time. That's one complication. And one of the things that may give you a clue about fluid buildup is the chest X-ray. So if the heart looks big on the chest X-ray, then that points to maybe fluid around the pericardium. And that is why I think anyone who comes in with pericarditis should uh, have a heart scan just to know whether there's any fluid building up. The second thing to say is that if there is bad inflammation of the pericardium, then sometimes these two layers, these two layers can stick to each other. And this can then uh, stop the pericardium from being compliant because these two layers have stuck to each other. And therefore, when the heart is moving, there's a restriction because of these layers being stuck together with, you know, all this inflammation and scar, etc. And when that happens, the heart is no longer now sitting in a nice pliant bag, but it's more like it's sitting in a hard, stiff case. And again, this can have the effect of stopping the heart from filling with blood, because when the heart tries to fill with blood, it's restricted by this pressure from this hard case that it's sitting in. And this therefore means that if the heart fills with less blood, it has less blood to pump out. This condition is termed constrictive pericarditis, constriction, and it complicates about 1% of pericarditis. This is a problem that becomes troublesome several months or years after the event of pericarditis. And many patients may then present with breathlessness, leg swelling, signs of heart failure, 
But when you then scan the heart, you say, oh, look, it's pumping okay. So you may be misled into thinking that it's not heart failure because the heart is pumping well. The problem is not that the heart cannot pump. The problem is that the heart cannot relax and fill with blood. So it's pumping, but it's not really pumping much blood out. And therefore, uh, if if someone has had pericarditis and then a year down the line or two years down the line they start finding that they're getting more breathless on exercise, their legs are beginning to swell up, then it's very important that history of pericarditis may be relevant because it may be constriction. Um, as I say, this is an infrequent uh, problem. It tends to be more in people who have recurrent pericarditis, 1% of um, the population, uh, one percent of pericarditis can be complicated by constriction. Uh, the important thing about this is that, of course, if you have that condition, constriction, then this is a potentially curable condition, right? Because what you can do is you can surgically remove this hard casing which the heart is sitting within and then the heart can relax and start filling up with blood. The important thing is that someone has to be able to think about it when it when someone presents with that and say, OK, you have to bear it in mind. There could be constriction because it can be easily missed. And then the patient may be put on lots of medications for um, heart failure and they're not getting better because the problem is a mechanical one. And eventually someone will say, OK, oh, my God, this was a constriction and you send them for an operation and, you know, the problem goes away. I had one patient uh, when I just started in York who for 10 years was being treated with uh, heart failure treatments and he was just in and out of hospital, in and out of hospital. And I recall seeing him and then he just casually mentioned, I would have missed it, but he casually mentioned he'd had pericarditis and I thought, oh, could he have constriction? And indeed he did turn out to have constriction. Uh, we sent him for an operation and have, he's now leading a completely normal life, not requiring any medications, feeling really well. So it's a very satisfying condition to diagnose and treat, uh, but doctors have to be alert to that. So if you've had pericarditis before and then later on in life you start getting breathless, it's important to remember that and mention that to the doctor. Uh, another problem is that sometimes if you have myocardial involvement, i.e. the inflammation is spreading from the pericardium into the heart, i.e. myopericarditis, then sometimes the heart can weaken because of this inflammation. And the, it, again, the echo will show that up. And if this is the case, then the patient may require supportive treatment with, for medica with medications for heart failure, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. The good news is once the pericarditis settles and patients are put on these medications, the heart generally strengthens back up in more than 90% of cases within a few months to a year. Perhaps the biggest problem uh, with pericarditis is about 30% of pericarditis can become recurrent, especially if we don't use a medicine called colchicine in the treatment initially. I'll talk you through the treatment of pericarditis first, and then I'll talk you through a little bit about the treatment of recurrent pericarditis. So once pericarditis is diagnosed, it's really important that uh, the pain is controlled because patients do experience a lot of pain, which is very uncomfortable. And in that sense, what we try and do is we use anti-inflammatory agents, which also act as painkillers, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, such as aspirin and brufen. Um, ibuprofen, they're generally used, but they're used at much higher doses. Uh, so a typical dose of brufen will be 600 to 800 milligrams every eight hours, or aspirin 750 to one gram three times a day. A lot of anti-inflammatory. And the problem, of course, with these non-steroidals is that they do increase the risk of ulcers by almost fourfold. They can increase uh, blood pressure, they can affect the kidneys. So therefore, they may not be for everyone, but it is always good to check with the doctor to see if these would be indicated in your case. Another medication that I've already mentioned is colchicine. Colchicine is an anti-inflammatory. I've actually done a video recently on the benefits of colchicine. And colchicine is usually recommended in addition to the non-steroidals because colchicine has been shown to significantly reduce symptoms and uh, symptoms at 72 hours <coughs> and is also associated, associated with a reduced recurrence of pericarditis. So recurrent pericarditis is less common in those people who are given colchicine during their index um, episode of pericarditis. Once the inflammatory markers start settling down, the inflammation starts settling down, the colchicine can be tapered down. 
You can also use steroids for patients who do not respond to non-steroidals or colchicine. One can use low-dose steroids. I want to emphasize low-dose because high-dose steroids paradoxically have been linked with an increase in um, risk of recurrence. But low-dose steroids can be helpful in reducing the inflammation and altering the course of the pericarditis. As I say, some people uh, develop 30% develop recurrent pericarditis, which is a real problem, which means that after four to six weeks, after a few months, the pericarditis comes back. And in those people, you can use stronger immunosuppressants such as methotrexate, uh, mycophenolate, uh, azathioprine, etc. There is a new set of uh, medications called IL-1 blockers. One of them is called anakinra, which may also reduce recurrent episodes, but there's more studies being done with this. Finally, if none of these measures work and a patient is really troubled with recurrent uh, pericarditis, then it may be possible to do a pericardectomy, which means you remove the sac surgically and therefore you won't get the inflammation of the sac. One other thing to know about is that if you're a competitive athlete and you've had pericarditis, then it is generally recommended that you abstain from competition for about three months. But people who are non-competitive athletes, just normal people, you know, you can start doing a bit of exercise after all the inflammatory markers have come down. So here's a little bit about pericarditis. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a little bit more of a niche subject, uh, but who knows, someone may be having pericarditis and they may have some questions. And I hope this video has gone some way into trying to um, answer these questions. In general, pericarditis is a self-limiting illness it is not dangerous and the prognosis is generally very good. It can be very, very painful though. And that's why I think it's important to know about the medications that we can use to try and um, make symptoms better. So I hope you found this useful. And uh, once again, thank you so much for all that you do for me. All the best.